Kenny, what's the questioning protocol? Are, they, are people just going to be able to ask questions? Um, I've been asking what worked out pretty good last time is I ask them to chat them to me and I'll read them to you so I can, you know, edit them or, you know, be a, be a filter if needed. But uh, last time went very well. Okay, good. Then I'll stop every now and then and ask if you have questions. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. And uh, we won't get anything from the YouTube viewers, but uh, if we need to, we, you know, I'll try and fill in some questions here or there, but uh, um, we'll see how it goes tonight. Feel free to just jump in whenever. Okay, I will do that. So I see B cubed, you guys are in, thank you very much. Um, we'll be getting going a little bit, waiting to see who else joins in and we'll follow what we did with the uh, with Commander Kilrain this afternoon on activities. All right, we'll give a couple more minutes here for everyone to log in.
All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Uh, we appreciate you logging in tonight. I know we're going to have a pretty good following here on YouTube Live. So uh, on behalf of the 2021 Rochester Schools Committee, we'd like to invite everybody here tonight. Thank you for being here. And our keynote speaker for this evening is Dr. Bashar Rick with the University of Arizona. Um, quick bio on Dr. Bashar as he pulls his camera on and can wave to everybody. Um, Dr. Bashar Rick has worked as an applied physicist at, in the university research and development setting for 40 years on various research and development projects. 35 of those years have been at the University of Arizona's Lunar and Planetary Laboratory working on spacecraft and remote sensing systems design and development, test calibration, planning and operations, data processing and analysis. Uh, Dr. Rick has also worked in radiometry, thermal modeling, radiative transfer, photogrammetry, stereo photo inclometry, ground-based astronomy, noise analysis, integrated circuit fabrication, laser and microwave device system development, and elementary particle physics. Dr. Rick was born in Dismas uh, excuse me, Damascus, Syria, but mostly grew up in cloudy Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. We know how that is up here in Wisconsin. In hazy Greenboro, North Carolina before he crossed the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains and discovered Tucson, Arizona with its clear nighttime skies. He enjoys spending his time with his wife and two children riding and biking. Dr. Rick holds a bachelor's of science degree in physics and chemistry, a master's of science degree in physics, and a PhD in planetary sciences. Uh, Dr. Rick is currently involved in NASA's uh, OSIRIS-REx program to land, retrieve, and return a small sample of Earth asteroid Beano to Earth. Uh, Dr. Rick will be providing two presentations with the intent of the second presentation to build on the first. So I know there's a lot of information you like. Dr. Bashar is very excited to be here, so I appreciate you spending your time tonight. Take it away there. Thank you so much, Kenny. I am really excited to be here. First, let me check how am I coming in and can you see the presentation? I can see her. It looks good on our end. All right, great. Um, I am Bashar Rizk, as Kenny said, and I'm a senior staff scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. I also serve as the OCAMS instrument scientist on OSIRIS-REx. So OSIRIS-REx stands for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, Regolith Explorer. That's a, quite a mouthful. It's a NASA mission headed by the University of Arizona with the partnership of uh, Lockheed Martin uh, Space Systems in Denver, Colorado, and Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, uh, to visit the asteroid Bennu and bring back a sample. You can see the spacecraft depicted here in my title slide. Um, and you can also see my one of my other uh, titles, which is a engineer slash scientist. So I'm a uh, that's my official title at the University of Arizona, and I bring that up because uh, the, the engineer slash scientist uh, portions of my brain are often in conflict, <laughs> just like they are in real life between engineers and scientists. The engineer is, uh, especially when it comes to space flight, is a predominantly conservative approach. Uh, the scientists wants all they can get and more. So when you are both, you, you are often uh, conflicted. And I would like to represent that com conflict by giving two presentations. So the presentation I'm giving today is predominantly hardware oriented. The one I'm gonna give tomorrow is predominantly connected with the results that we uh, achieved at Bennu. Um, and so hopefully by, by looking and contrasting those two different presentations, we can get a flavor and a sense of what this whole space flight and space exploration endeavor is all about. It tries to address two aspects of our personality. One, the desire to know what's out there, and two, the desire to get it right and not make any mistakes. So this is the spacecraft. So I told you this was gonna be a hardware presentation. I'm gonna have seven sections to this talk. It's gonna go on for almost an hour, but please feel free to ask questions. Uh, I love questions because usually they're, they involve things I haven't thought about, and um, it's nice for people to challenge the speaker. Um, 
I'm going to start with an intro section that basically describes the spacecraft and our instrument. Um, I, I'm the OCAMS instrument scientist. OCAM stands for the Osiris Rex camera suite. So we have three cameras that I'm going to describe. And most of the rest of the presentation, which is six other sections, will be stories about the camera on the mission and various things that we encountered when we went when we got out there. So if you look at the spacecraft, you see what constitutes a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter bus. The bus is the basic frame of the spacecraft. It's the, it's the frame that everything else is mounted to. So you can see the science deck at the top with the sample return capsule. You can see the solar arrays folded at the sides, the high gain antenna at the front. The, the spacecraft is already, and I've, I've listed some of the key statistics there, the spacecraft is already starting to take on the character of a person. If you consider the solar arrays, the arms, and the person is facing toward us with their mouth where the, the high gain antenna is, the head where the SRC is, and all of the different instruments on top. The, um, the spacecraft is special. This mission is special because we intended to, at the outset, collect a sample from the asteroid Bennu. And I'm going to move this so you guys can see better. Um, and this is a depiction of what the sample event would look like. Uh, hopefully, it'll start up now. Yeah, there we go. So um, we, we are leaving orbit around this object, Benny, which was one of the smallest objects it's possible to even have an orbit around. And we set two records in the Guinness Book of World Records for the lowest orbit ever achieved around any object in the solar system. We leave orbit and head toward the surface with our TAG sample arm or our TAG SAM arm. TAG stands for touch and go sampling, by the way, uh, with this um, a carburetor-like looking <laughs> container in, in which we channel a bunch of high pressure nitrogen gas through the bottom of and kick up the surface of the asteroid Bennu. Uh, and the, the, the gas escapes through the, the carburetor and leaves the sample entrained in it, the sample head. Now, that's one of the things that makes it special. The other thing that makes it special is we're going to try to return this sample back to Earth. And to do that, we recruited the, uh, the sample return capsule from a mission called Stardust, which I show on the left there. Stardust's mission was to take the aerogel containers you see depicted there and fly through the, the, the debris cloud of a comet and collect as many cometary particles as it could. It would open up first, collect the particles, close up, and then head back to Earth. It was a complete success. The sample was returned successfully to Earth. We used the same sample return capsule on the right there as predict is depicted OREX as uh, SRC. And we're going to nestle that carburetor-like looking sample head into this container. Hopefully, you can see my cursor there as it's moving around the, the attachment point for the sample head. Once it's inside and the lid is safely closed, we head back toward Earth and we detach the SRC from the main spacecraft while the main spacecraft is on a collision course with the Earth. And then having been detached, the main spacecraft diverts from the Earth and the SRC continues on until it enters the atmosphere. Once it enters the atmosphere at seven and a half miles, an hour, uh, miles a second, it's gonna get really hot really fast. So the thing that protects it are these two heat shield components. One is the main heat shield here at the front or the top. That's the, the forward facing face of this SRC. Uh, it's made out of a, a substance called pica, stands for phenolic impregnated ceramic ablator. And you can see microscopic depictions of pica there on the left. You can see how the stuff is separated from itself so that heat will have a hard time conducting through it uh, once one side gets hot, the other side can say relatively cool. At least that's the theory and was proven on stardust. The other end, the back end is SLA, which is a silicone elastomeric charring, charring ablator. Any kind of an ablator is a substance that burns off as you're getting hot so as to protect. So it uses up energy and protects the stuff that's inside. And you can see 
the various components of the SRC here, including the, the, the sample head depicted attached in. Where are we now in the mission? And let me move this out of the way here. There we go. Um, today's Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. You're, uh, we're, I'm talking to you at a very special time in the mission. In a week, we depart the asteroid on May 10th. So next Tuesday, a uh, week from today. Uh, we've been through a lot. We started, we were selected in 2011 and five years of development followed when we were building all of our instruments and the spacecraft. I've had the privilege of being involved since the beginning. Um, the spacecraft was integrated or assembled and then integrated starting in 2015 and launched at the, near the, uh, the fall of 2016. We had two years or two and a half years of outbound crews. We arrived at Bennu in the fall of 2018. All the important things seem to happen in the fall on this mission. Um, we flew by the Earth and Moon along the way, and I'll get to that in a second. Then we had a good two and a half years at the asteroid, uh, which is ending next week when we leave. And then we'll have another couple year cruise till we drop off the sample in September of 2023. And then follows another two year sample analysis period. Um, on the, in the, the painting there, we depict the, the, the um, spacecraft leaving Bennu. So I'm gonna show a launch video and I'm, I'm sure this crowd is used to looking at launch videos, uh, but it's incumbent on me to show it. So I'm just gonna go ahead and um, there it goes. It's a, it's an, a comprises of a period of an hour in the life of this mission, but a very, very terrifying hour because we were getting the spacecraft off the ground and into space and on its way away from the Earth. So it's got a, in one, the space of one hour, uh, lift out of the Earth's atmosphere and escape the Earth's gravitational, direct, uh, gra gravitational pull. On the right, I've depicted the various stages. So we're on the left now still in this first stage where we're climbing out of the Earth's atmosphere vertically. And then I'm gonna speed up the video a little bit. Most of the hour I'm gonna throw away and I'm just gonna include a few highlights from this Mission. So you can see I'm moving away from the Earth's surface here much faster than anything we've managed to build uh, yet in human rocketry. Uh, but I'm speeding up so we can get to the part where we separate the one strap-on solid rocket booster. This is an Atlas Centaur IV, by the way. Um, so that booster is going to go bye-bye in a second. And then we're going to start, we're going to engage the, uh, the, the, the secondary booster after we separate from the ring. And that's gonna come up here in, in, in any time now. Here it is. And you can see the shadow of the booster flying away um, in a second. And we will separate the, the payload fairing. So there's the, sep there's the um, attachment ring and the booster is behind it toward the earth. And then we're gonna separate the fairing here and that's gonna go bye-bye as well, uh, revealing the spacecraft ready to be deployed. And then of course, there's a half an hour or 45 minute period where we boost around the earth and get to the precise uh, location where, we, where when we separate from the spacecraft, we'll be going in the correct direction. So that'll start us on the mission and I'm gonna, wait for the, the separation video because it's kind of neat. This, this mission was well instrumented with cameras, by the way. So a lot of these cameras um, are made by Eclipse for this um, early uh, rocketry portion where we're leaving the Earth. So here is the separation and you can see particles of ice, which we saw on in the initial launch, still floating around uh, the the spacecraft booster and and um, space in the near in the near Earth environment. Okay, so once we launched, we were on our way, and I'm going to play this video. Yeah, there we go. And I'm going to take this up here. So I, I already talked about how everything takes two 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 and a half years. 
we catch up with the asteroid. First, we go around the Earth, sorry, around the sun once, and we encounter the Earth-Moon system. Now, this is uh, actually a safety thing. Uh, that gave us a whole year where we, if we had some, we had somehow had delays in the assembly of the spacecraft, we could still have launched into our original orbit and gone to our original target. I'm going to skip over all the parts in the middle where we were near the asteroid proximity operations. I'm going to go right to the part where we've already successfully gotten the sample, as you saw in that previous video. And this is where we deploy the sample in the SRC and guillotine the sample head away from the TAGSAM arm. And now we return to Earth. Now, the amount of energy that we need to get to this object is remarkably small because this object is a very uh, close companion of the Earth as it moves around the sun. Uh, in fact, it's almost a quasi-satellite, not quite, but almost. Here you see the SRC separating from the spacecraft and heading toward the Earth. At this point, the spacecraft will divert. So the, the, this object, Bennu, goes around the sun five times for every time the Earth goes around six times. So every six years, Earth and Bennu meet back at the same place. That was the site of our Earth-Moon gravity assist. This is the, an image of the, of the spacecraft uh, falling to Earth under its parachute and hopefully touching down in a gentle fashion at the Utah Test and Training Range. This is footage of the uh, Stardust capsule being opened, and this is a test image from the, our actual sample head, and it shows that the, 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 the mechanism is plenty capable of picking up a lot of material, which we hope it did. So now these, I'm going to shift gears here and stop talking about the spacecraft and talk about our own cameras. So these three cameras are the cameras that we built as part of the Osiris Strikes Camera Suite, or OCAMS. Each of these cameras, unusually for space flight instrumentation, included a mechanism. And they were important to the function, otherwise we wouldn't have included them, because as everyone knows, or as I would hope everyone knows in this, um, on this call, um, NASA does not like flying mechanisms. Um, because they are inherently risky. Uh, there is always the risk of malfunction. You're dealing with a vacuum environment. Uh, you're, you're flying lubricants that are uh, very expensive and though very reliable, anything can happen and they're uh, subject to the extremes of temperature and, and, and degradation, especially by solar radiation maybe. So, the three mechanisms for these cameras are a filter wheel mechanism for the map camera, mapping camera. That was our medium uh, range camera. It's got five times the field of view of the sample acquisition, sorry, one fifth the field of view of the sample acquisition camera, which is designed to look at the sample head during the moment of, of sample acquisition or tag. And it's got five times the field of view of our polyfunctional camera or polycam which whose mechanism, unlike the SAM cam and the MAP cam, which were both filter wheels, its mechanism is a focus mechanism. So it allowed itself, we could have a variable focus, which we needed because we used it uh, at a widely disparate range to target. Uh, we, we were able to detect Bennu with this uh, telescope uh, at, a, at a range of, of something like 2 million kilometers and we were also able to image the surface at a range of something like 180 meters. So that's quite the, 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 the range of variation. And that was made possible by the focus mechanism. The, the map cam itself held, held different uh, color bandwidth filters that we used to good effect at Bennu. And the SAM cam, we expected to get contaminated by all the dust blown up during tag. So we included copies of the same window to allow the ability to make three separate tag attempts because the, the spacecraft itself carried three separate bottles of nitrogen to enable a tag attempt apiece in case we failed with the first one. And I think I see a chat here. Let me just check. Um, have we got any questions? Yeah, we do, uh, we do have one actually from uh, one of the teachers asking, uh, will the departure next week, the, the May 10th departure, Vastra, do you know will that be online? Will it be live? Uh, 
You know, I should like it, to have it her. It won't be live, unfortunately, because everything is delayed by the light time travel from where um, OREX is right now with Bennu, which is basically on the other side of the sun from the Earth. Uh, but we will, we have been pretty good about uploading video, uploading images, um, and, and various um, news and status from the mission on the website. And I'll show a slide at the end that'll give the links. Uh, okay. if you that guys sounds good. To the, yeah, okay, great. There was a, another question that came up about too, as you're flying around the earth and getting near Earth orbit that, is there any concerns about managing space debris? You know, SpaceX is sending something up every other day and, you know, satellites are falling apart and such. Is there a, is there a concern over that? Always. Um, we ourselves won't contribute to the problem because we don't have any space to, debris to, to speak of, except what I'm about to show you in a second, but that's mostly ice. Um, people that, that worry about space debris are launching stuff to low Earth orbit. And that's kind of the, the, the area. It's, it's really kind of weird. If you're very low, then you don't worry about it much because that stuff is eventually going to burn up in the atmosphere um, after a period of time. But if you've launched into an orbit that's like, oh, let's say uh, 500 kilometers and bigger uh, from the surface of the Earth, then that stuff will stay there a pretty long time. And it, with that length of time, it runs the risk of running into something else and creating more debris. And that's the problem that people have foreseen with space debris. There's this uh, famous idea. I think it's, it starts with a K. I think it's, you'll probably know it, Kenny, but it's, uh, it's named after the person that, that worried about it first, I guess, or at least was the first, excuse me, to publish about it, which is that there's a cascading effect or feedback effect. When you start breaking stuff in orbit, you generate more particles the particles hit more things, they generate even more particles and pretty soon you're on a, 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 on a vicious circle you can't get out of. And that's what people are worried about. So these days when you launch something, you better have a plan to deorbit it or you won't get to be able to launch it. And that's kind of where we're at now. But I'd say that as a community, we're still holding our breath. <laughs> All right, well, that sounds good. I appreciate that. Uh... Yeah, let's continue where you're at. More questions come in, we'll, we'll break you up. Okay, great. So that concludes the intro part of the, of the talk. And, oh, wait, one more slide. And that's the, um, let me see how am I doing on time. Oh, I'm 25 minutes. I better yep, speed you're doing, up. You're doing great. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully you'll still say that in 15 minutes. So this is the, these are the fields of view of our various optical instruments. I'm just going to go through this quickly, but my three cameras are shown here on the right. Uh, there's the SAM cam in the big yellow box, the map cam in the green, and the poly cam in the blue. And you can see how they're kind of offset from each other, mostly because of the tilt of the SAM cam, because that's what's required for it to be able to look at the, the, the sample head. And then compared to the optical navigation cameras, which are really wide field cameras, you can see the fields of view laid out here. And then compared in this inset on the top right to the point spectrometers, that's the the Zyrus Rex thermal emission spectrometer and the Zyrus Rex visible and infrared spectrometer, those point spectrometers have a field of view that's even smaller than a polycam pixel, which is what's shown there. Or, sorry, polycam field of view. Um, the, um, the next section will talk about debris. And I want to introduce it by saying. We did some fun stuff on the way out to Benny. One of the fun things we did was about five months after we launched, we conducted a 10 day search for Earth Trojan asteroids. Now Trojans are asteroids or the generic name for asteroids that occupy special places in the orb orbit of any body that's orbiting the sun in, our, in this case, but it could be any three body problem. And th that's L4 and L5 or Lagrange 4 and Lagrange 5. They are one of the two out of the five Lagrange points or stable points in the, uh, the joint trajectory of a three body problem where if you put something there, it will tend to stay there and requires an infusion of energy in order to get boosted out of those locations. So we expect, though we haven't really detected 
uh, per se uh, Earth Trojan asteroids to be at the L4, L5 points, or at least we think we, that they should be there. And how many are there will tell us some significant things about the origin of the solar system. So we decided to look for them. We never, we didn't detect them after a 10 day search. We did detect a, a bunch of main belt asteroids. But what we also detected were objects, bright streaks moving around the spacecraft in a weird fashion, very UFO-like. Um, they were also observed in the navigation cameras, and they look very out of focus as if they're very much in the near field. The, the camera that is seeing them here is the map cam, which has a uh, field of view of four degrees, oops, four degrees wide, um, similar to Brisbane, but been observed on other spacecraft missions, and it's believed to be particles shedding, being shed by the spacecraft, specifically water ice which is retained from, as you saw during launch, uh, all the way through separation. So it's, it's a good bet it's still on the spacecraft. These particles were observed down to the limit of visibility. And the further away they got from the spacecraft, the, the more into the map cam focus regime they got. So you can see how they're getting smaller and more in focus the further away they get. Um, so we were able to use the out of focus behavior of the map cam and it's Near field focus starts at 125 meters. So any closer and things start to get blurry. We were able to use that as a kind of a range finder and infer the, the particle diameter from the brightness. So we, um, and I show this here, we managed to capture this one particle streaking away from the spacecraft and, and extrapolate it back to the spacecraft in a location right here, tucked away behind the high gain antenna. Now, why is this interesting? Well, and I, I decided to show, <laughs> to, to horrify and disgust you, I tried, decided to show a little bit of the math that we followed doing this, but I'm not gonna get into that because I think I'm running a little short on time. We, 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 um, we tracked it to here and this place is special because it's usually in shadow and only comes out of shadow when sun shines on the science deck. Usually sun is shaded from the science deck by the high gain antenna. That's one of the things that you, um, that you try to do on these missions. The spacecraft isn't turned willy nilly uh, toward the sun uh, at any attitude. Usually it has a preferred face it likes to expose toward the sun. And in the interest of thermal control, usually that leaves uh, something with a lot of critical items on it, like the science deck in shadow. But every now and then we need to point toward a specific portion of the sky that we'd like to image or study. And the, the science deck experiences sunlight. And when that happens, it heats up. Now on this, again, I'm gonna horrify and disgust you by showing these, these uh, busy plots. But what I'm showing here on the left side is a uh, date or time on the X axis. This is um, starting uh, from 2016 through 2017, basically the middle of the year, um, after launch, basically. And this is the solar angle to the tag SAM side. And for all intents and purposes, this is for, for, the, for the science deck or the, the, the side of the, the spacecraft away from the sun. This is how much sun it will see. So when these lines drop below this blue line, then that represents sunrise for this side of the spacecraft. So when those periods, which we've identified here by the days of year in these uh, labels, when we see that, we notice that's when we start to observe these particles coming off the spacecraft as if they're being heated uh, and, and pushed away from the surface and then launched into space. And that is in fact what we think is happening. So that's debris. Um, I'll stop for questions. Any questions at this point? Okay, good. Uh, we're, we're good right now. Everyone's uh, just in awe of watching all the math. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Oh, you're perfectly fine. This is great. I, I didn't want to talk down to you guys. I mean, you, this is the real stuff. This is the real deal. Stuff comes along. You don't know what the heck it's, is happening at first, and you just got to deal with it. And I tried to pick these examples in that fashion. But the good side of that is often you're able to turn lemons into lemonade. You have something bad or unexpected happen, 
but it's rare when something bad happens that doesn't have a good side effect. And that's kind of one of the themes I wanted to talk about today. In any case, another thing, so I'm gonna move on to the next section now. Yep. Another thing that we worried about before launch was, was the spacecraft gonna be a stable enough platform to allow us to do uh, serious astronomical observation, which as a lot of people know, requires exposure times that are measured in seconds or more, tens of seconds, if not tens of hours. Now we're not gonna, we weren't counting on being able to go tens of hours. In fact, that would have been bad for the spacecraft because it would have had to hold a position that would have put it thermally at risk. But we wanted to be able to expose for seconds so that we could see better. And what we worried about the pointing, and this is uh, 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 three slides that demonstrate, and I'm gonna show here the, the, the first slide basically shows us moving to five different positions on the sky, holding those positions uh, after slewing there, and then taking pictures there. Now I'm gonna show you um, what it looks like in close up. So I've just focused on one of those positions, and I did a, a, a micro study of the spacecraft's pointing and how it jittered during that period. And you can see at first it comes in and it wanders all around, but then it settles down to a, a reasonable area here. And this box, by the way, is the size of a polycam pixel, which is basically uh, 15 micro radians, if that means anything to you, or three arc seconds. I'm gonna show that pixel again, close up, and this is the stable portion of the trajectory or pointing. And I wanted to see how much it would stay within that pixel for a long period of time. Now you can see the time clicking over there on the left and it's gone from eight minutes to 16 minutes. So that's a good long period, eight minutes. That's longer, much longer than any exposure we employed on the mission. And you can see that the, that the, the spacecraft isn't doing that bad. It's staying within a polycam pixel most of the time. And you're able to quantify that and show a scattered plot and all the rest of that. And I had that, but I took them out in the interest of time. Another thing we worried about was the poly, oh, I'm gonna stop here. Questions at, that, at this point? Okay, hearing none, I'm gonna proceed. Another thing we worried about, and I'm sorry about the really busy nature of this plot, but I'm gonna step through these images in a second is the focus of the polycam. Now, the polycam has a lot of items on its plate because it can see the asteroid as a point source from millions of kilometers, and it can also see and hopefully make out particles or pebbles on the surface of the asteroid uh, less than one centimeter in diameter, um, which is really quite remarkable. You can pull something in focus from that range on a moving platform. Uh, we built this thing to be really sensitive. It's an F3 optical system. So it only needed a few milliseconds to make that exposure. So motion blur wasn't gonna be uh, a problem. Um, we even slewed while we imaged. So <laughs> that's how it showed how, how cavalierly or, or, or cowboy-like our, our philosophy was. We, we built such a sensitive camera. The thing that was a problem was if the thing itself was in focus. And when we're moving toward a target, uh, always moving, always changing, and the target itself, I haven't shown you a picture of the surface yet, but it looks like, uh, well, I don't wanna say anything bad, but it's, it's, imagine the rockiest surface you've ever seen in your life and multiply it by 10. That's what Bennu's, the surface of Bennu looks like. It's an absolute rubble pile. So the range to target is changing every so often by quite dramatic uh, distances. On the top left here, we have the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter, which was a contributed instrument provided by the Canadian Space Agency. And it provided a nice dependable range to surface. We took that range to surface, we fed it to the spacecraft, and then the polycam, which is the focusable camera here that's depicted on all the other slides here. And I'm showing here the focus mechanism and it's very, very interesting, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time uh, in the interest of time dwelling on it. I'm happy to take questions on it um, afterward because I love talking about it. So we took the, the range information and we used a table, which I'm gonna show now. So this is the polygon focus table. 
and it allowed us to move the motor step to the, right, the correct position based on our calibrations. So we were able to, in real time, away from Earth, away from any ground in the loop, we were able to focus the camera in a very unique autofocus <laughs> that involved one other instrument contributed by another country, the spacecraft avionics, and our own software, which was quite a feat. We did really well, too. So this is a, a, a graph, and I'm sorry again about the graph, but I'm sorry, you can't, I can't hide you from everything here. This is the, the, the position of range to Bennu as measured by Ola, and the, the flat places are where it's not on. The, the, the jiggly places are where Ola's on, and it's measuring the actual range to surface from this really, really gnarly body that we're orbiting. And then this is the polycam turned on and moving from focus position to focus position. So there are four focus positions, four valid ones depicted here, and two shutter positions. That's where the optical path is closed. You don't want to be there. You want to be in one of these green spots. And we followed it really well. So here are the, the ranges in the, as green dots over a seven day, actually two week period, uh, depict, uh, captured by Ola. And then the black uh, dots are where we move from focus position to focus position. And I, I've localized on one of these, you can see I've, I've circled it here and I've shown it on the right. And you can see that as the Ola moves away from, sorry, moves closer to Bennu, uh, so does the polycam. It moves to a closer focus and then back again. So that worked, which was a really um, cool thing to have happen. It was all theoretical. And then I, I did a roll up here where I showed where the scatter of the um, defocus was. For us, anything within a couple of focus positions of our nominal focus was considered acceptable. And we see here that we did better than that in this scatter plot on the right. Okay, and moving to tag here, and I'm gonna just run this reel while I'm taking any questions about what I've talked about already. Okay, tag, I don't know if you've seen this image, but it's, it's been spread around a lot. Uh, this is me just being cute. I'm sorry about that, but I sped up the last 110 seconds of tag. Um, I forget how many images, I think it was like 90 some images into a three second GIF so that you wouldn't have to wait and people could get the impact of what it was like to push toward this asteroid ignite something as high pressure as that bottle of nitrogen and watch all heck break loose as this thing, which was at zero gravity before, suddenly experienced energies and momentums that it had not experienced, you know, once every few hundred thousand years. So let me just go to this uh, GIF, which basically shows it in clock time. So this is what it actually looks like to the spacecraft to approach the surface of Bennu. On the left, I have an image, a SAMCAM image with no labeling. On the right, we have little labelings that basically label you the, the frame number, the width, the, the time, you know, elapsed time, all that good stuff. So what's depicted here is the sample arm with the sample head at the end. Uh, all of the, the, the nitrogen gas bottles, the, the wrist motors, all a lot of stuff is buried here in this. Um, uh, under this thermal blanket, which is blackened as you can see, because, and then we go, here's the igniting of the bottle. And you notice the first image after that initial post uh, tag image, I, I changed this, I kept the same image, but changed the stretch. And here all heck is breaking loose. And now we fire our thrusters to back away. So it stirs up the cloud even more. And now we're blacking away. We're, we've kicked up so much dust that it's casting a shadow initially and darkening the area around the tag SAM arm, but as we back away, we back away into sunlight. And now you can see still, you can see part of the cloud that's shown. Now I'm gonna show more of this tomorrow in the presentation I'm gonna to present tomorrow, but I just thought it'd be good for people that couldn't make that presentation tomorrow to see what tag looked like um, to the SAM cam. And I'm gonna stop here and let this thing run while I take questions, if there are any. Um, yeah, there's just one question here is, with the uh, impact of Benno, is there a chance of moving it out of orbit or having a chance? No, of the forces are too, too small. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to 
know the trajectory of this thing six ways from Sunday, but um, it doesn't look like it. It's just, we, we make too little of an impact on this thing. It's dealing with much bigger fish. <laughs> gotcha. Um, the other, the other question that's uh, coming in is the, uh, the complexity of this, of this uh, uh, probe device. Is this more complex or less complex than, let's say, a, a, the current Mars rovers? It's less complex because it's a, a basically a passive device. It uses a passive means to acquire the sample. It works like a reverse vacuum cleaner. Instead of creating a vacuum in a pressurized environment and sucking up material, we pressurize a volume in a vacuum and that pressurized area or volume scoops up a bunch of material, tries to escape out through the mechanism and then leaves the, the material that it collected behind enclosed within the, uh, the uh, capture areas of the, of the canister. Now that is, does not require firing, <laughs> doesn't require firing something into an unknown surface where you're not sure of the consistency of the cohesion of the surface and you don't know whether that thing is gonna stick. In fact, we've already seen multiple examples on, on um, landed missions where you go to the surface and the surface proves much harder than you thought it was gonna be. Now, we didn't think that was gonna happen here, but we made a huge effort to try to validate and verify the surface of this body before we ever touched it to make sure there would be stuff on the surface that could be scooped up. Once we knew that that was true, then this mechanism was all but guaranteed to, to work. Now that, that all said, we sweated this like anybody would, right? Not having done it at all in real life, right? Only having tested it uh, as many ways as we could um, and test as you fly scenarios. So I hope that answers the question. I um, believe it does. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> all right, so one of the neat things about TAG was our original error ellipse was 50 meters wide. In other words, we were not guaranteed of hitting our desired target um, sample site to anywhere within 25 meters. And that 25 meters was, we could potentially be 25 meters away and that would have been allowed by the statistics. When we got to Bennu and saw how rocky it was, that was just not going to fly. If you were 25 meters in error on any one of our top sample sites, you'd be on top of a boulder or something. You would be not anywhere inside whatever crater you had identified. So we needed a lot better targeting system. So instead of our original primary targeting system, which was based on timing and laying down a approach groove, we went to natural feature tracking, which was a feedback system. So it was a little bit more complicated because it required a control loop, but it was still autonomous and would work at the spacecraft without ground in the loop. And with that, we managed to beat one meter error. And I'm just, this, this curve is depicting that. The, the cross is where we tagged, the blue is where we thought we would tag. So that's pretty darn good. Well, you do all that, you do perfect tag, and then you go and you look at what you got and this is what you see. <laughs> you see, you got so much sample that it's spilling out. <laughs> Every time you move the sample head, to take a better picture, stuff spills out. In fact, if you count the stuff and you look, you look at how the rate at which it's escaping, which I'm showing here in this image, you see it's escaping about 10 grams or 20 grams every time you turn that thing. So even if you started with 400 grams inside the thing or more, you're losing it. You're losing it at probably a significant fraction of the stuff is inside. Why is, what the heck is going on? Well, what has happened is, and I'm comparing here images in the post tag uh, image suite. Uh, this one on the left is taken before, in fact, two years before tag um, in November of 2018, you can see an absolutely empty and pristine sample head. You, you can't tell here, but there is a transparent mylar flab, flap here um, that is that my cursor is, is tracking across here, but you can't see it because it's transparent. 
Uh, it's sort of reflecting light right here, so you can sort of tell. But it, it basically covers this entire inner cavity. That mylar flap is jammed open in the image on the right, which is taken post tag by a, the bunch of rocks that we collect. You can see the stones there. You can see the pebbles. You can see they've got random shapes and patterns as they, as they jammed into the, the uh, interior of this thing. So we're pretty sure we, our tag Sam head contained and contains a population of pebbles, but we can't prove it. But based on those images, basically, largely, and based on the, the movies I just showed of us tagging and doing such a good job, we decided to not directly measure the mass inside the head because that was held out the potential of losing even more material because that means of measuring the mass involved us sticking our tag sam arm out and waving it back and forth to measure the moment of inertia. We decided to not go that route. You know, years of planning and preparation for such a sensitive maneuver, really cool, clever maneuver uh, come, uh, invented by the, the engineers at Lockheed Martin just had to be canceled at the last minute. And we decided to stow the sample head and, and cut the, the guillotine and, and go home, close up shop and go home. So I'm showing an image here of us stowing the sample head. And you can see on the left, particles are still flying away, especially after the thing hits and gets locked into the mechanism. And then on the right, we kind of pull on the thing and make sure it's fully in. And that's something I think everyone can understand. You can, you can see the thing trying to leave the capture mechanism, but not being able to. So that, let me see what we're doing on time here. I, I'll stop here for questions. Oh, we're good. We had 11 minutes. Yep, you're doing good. Okay, good. So I'm in the last, uh, the last section here. And the last thing I want to talk about is entry. So I'm showing here the timeline again um, after you've seen all this. So we, we got to Bennu in 20, excuse me, fall of 2018. Um, I will show images and movies from that um, uh, tomorrow, hopefully you guys can see it. Uh, it's it's going to involve a, a few anaglyph stereo movies and anaglyph stereo images. And anaglyph just basically means it's a means of view, viewing 3D, displaying and viewing 3D through red blue glasses. And I'm hoping uh, just about everyone on the call has access to such glasses. They 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 give them away pretty cheap at uh, at science fairs. You can just buy a paper version, which was what most people use um, for, for a buck or less, 50 cents. Um, and they allow you to see 3D if you have an anaglyph uh, uh, image. So I'm going to show that tomorrow. I'll show a few examples today just so you can see what I'm talking about. So we are going to leave the asteroid in a, in, in a week. We'll spend two years coming back home. And once we come back home, we have to get this capsule safely inside the Earth's atmosphere down on the ground. And that's what this slide is talking about. So here's the timeline for this uh, intense 13 and a half minute period that starts when we do what's called entry interface at 125 kilometers altitude. And that's gonna happen on um, 143829 UTC or basically 738 local time. <laughs> which is in Utah um, um, on September 24th, 2023. Um, we are coming in at around seven and a half miles a second, 12.2 kilometers a second. Uh, we do our last but one trajectory correction maneuver a week before. We do our last TCM, which, which could be canceled. We, we have a history of canceling TCMs because we're doing such a good job targeting on this mission. Um, by the way, the people that do our targeting, our flight dynamics is our, our combination of kinetics, aerospace in um, Simi Valley, California, and in Tempe, Arizona, and uh, Goddard Space Flight Center uh, Flight Dynamics Group. They've done an amazing job. So we do a last possible TCM two days before entry interface, and we release the SRC four hours before E, and then 3.7 hours, we divert the bus. We divert the main spacecraft so it, it too doesn't crash into the Earth. Peak heating occurs really quickly after 51 seconds after 
entry interface, which is at 20, 125 kilometers. So less than a minute later, you're at 60 kilometers and you're experiencing peak heating, which means you're, you're slowing down the most then, and then peak pressure is just, just a little bit later, 10 seconds later. You're, you're heating up the most and you're slowing down the most uh, 60 cl clicks later or 40 miles later. So in those 40 miles, you go, you, you take those 40 miles in less than a minute, which is really quite fast. The drogue deploys uh, two minutes, 15 seconds after E, and the main chute deploys uh, about eight minutes after that, after E, and then 13 and a half minutes later, you're down on the ground, hopefully. You touch down in the Utah Test and Training Range, uh, and this is a picture of the air ellipse or the footprint of the, of the potential touchdown zone. Uh, Salt Lake is right there, uh, as long as Salt Lake City. Um, we're coming in from the southwest, and this is a blown up view of that area. And we, um, and this is, these are the, our trajectory compared to other uh, sample return missions. Genesis was the one that uh, the chute didn't deploy and it impacted on the surface right around there. Stardust uh, came in successfully and landed right around there. And OREX we're expecting to land in the same general area. And this is a picture of what it looks like on the ground. We hope to be here uh, just a few minutes before 8 a.m. on September 24th, 2023. And we'll touch down at a few meters a second and with a little bit of lateral translation. And I think that's it. That's, um, this is the slide that gives you some of the links. And I also will show, uh, I'm gonna pause here and then I'm gonna show, um, this is what an anaglyph stereo looks like. So if you had anaglyph glasses, you'd be able to see a picture of the tag site just before we scrambled it all to heck. And now I'll take questions. Um, one of the questions actually came from my wife, uh, watching on the side. She says, uh, Dr. Rick, you're very excited about what you're doing. Um, you get up every morning going, hey, I'm going to work to check this out. Is that a driving factor? I mean, it looks like you really engaged yourself into this, uh, into your career. Well, um, that's interesting you say <laughs> I'm pretty family oriented. Most of the major decisions in my life have been made as a result of family. Um, I wouldn't say I stumbled into this field, but um, I kicked around a lot. And I always knew, a, I, I guess I, I wanted to do something technical, uh, but it, it didn't much matter to me what it was. Um, I knew I'd find just about anything interesting. I was lucky enough to stumble into this field when I got my career start on the Cassini mission. And I was able to be part of the Huygens lander. Um, and we had the camera on the Huygens lander and it was the one that revealed the first images ever of the surface of Titan from the ground. And I was, I think the first person to see those images. Um, so that's kind of where I got my training. And then um, on this mission, uh, we went through a lot and you kind of have to have an attitude of, I wouldn't say upbeat, <laughs> but you can't let things get you down. You got to get up every morning like it's a new day uh, because it is and anything can happen and, and, and leave yourself open to the possibility that the things that are going to happen are going to be good. And if you've got a problem, just work the problem, you know, be patient, engage others. Um, surround yourself with people that are um, as smart or smarter than you. You know, it's just, it's, there's nothing new about any of the things I'm saying. Um, you just, you, you have to persevere. You have to remember that um, every day is a blessing. Every day we get another chance and um, don't let life get you down. Now, all that is easily said, <laughs> but... <laughs> No, it's uh, it's all very, very yeah, true. And I appreciate you being honest about that. So, um, some of the other questions we've got here is, uh, and you've mentioned a few of them, but what do you think is your your most nervous point of this whole mission? Is it standing in Utah watching and hoping that parachute opens, or or was it the tag or getting the sample secured? What what would you say held you to that point? That's a great one. Uh, this mission has been remarkably event-free. Uh, I think if there was a, and forgive me, 
the profanity an OS moment on the on the mission, it would be when we saw particles being ejected from the surface of Bennu, when we didn't expect it. Uh, we got close to Bennu, we, we achieved orbit uh, just after Christmas break uh, in January, 2019, after we got to the asteroid, been around the asteroid for about a month and a half. And we uh, observed in some pictures that were taken by the nav cameras, the particles were flying off the surface of Bennu. And the first thought was, what if one of these things hits the spacecraft? Nobody knew at that point whether that was gonna be a bad thing or a good thing. We were pretty sure it wasn't gonna be bad because these particles weren't moving all that fast. But you never know, right? The spacecraft is designed for some durability. It's shaken like crazy uh, before it ever leaves the ground and make sure we withstand the, 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 the stress of launch, but you never know. So that was probably the moment where everybody was like, now what happens? <laughs> well, understood there. How long did it actually take to build the, the probe that was launched? About five years. Wow. How many times did you change? You know, being an engineer, I know how it goes. You got your design here and uh, you start to build the widget, do this and that, it changes. You're back over here. Did you go to the Every drawing day. a couple times? Every day. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're, 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 you got your hats on every minute of every day. Uh, you're always looking at things with two minds. Uh, you're trying to translate the scientific goals of the mission to the engineering reality. Um, that's not always easy, but you, you, you always have a vision of where you're going and you have people around you that will, will call you on whatever <laughs> they think you're doing that's wrong. And you, you also are doing the same to them. And that's just the process. We, we individually can't be perfect. We're humans. We make mistakes, ganga mistakes. You're always trying to correct them, but you're always going to make them, right? But mm -hmm. together, we can function and create something perfect because we're all helping each other. We're all working together. That's yeah. kind of how it goes. Good balance of checks and balances is basically what's happening. Yeah. So uh, two other questions you might be able, and in case this was missed, is there any concerns over contamination with particles coming back? And what is the overall point of learning from what we do collect as samples? Yeah, I'll get into the second question more tomorrow where we talk about why we're doing all this. For the first question, you're gonna have contamination, it's, it's inevitable. But what we did on this mission that was, uh, I wouldn't say unique because I've seen it on other missions, but it was very extensively carried out on this mission was a, a, a thorough system of witness plates. So at every juncture, and this is through the manufacture of all the instruments, all of the spacecraft components, everything, you would have a witness plate. And whatever was contaminating the spacecraft was contaminating the witness plate. So you will be able to sample that witness plate and learn what the contaminant looks like spectroscopically. And that was gonna be as useful as anything to allow you to correct for contamination. That said, we had a huge contamination control plan. We had to know what we were doing to this, to the our instrument, to anything that was gonna be on the spacecraft at all times. And we had to do a concerted series of measurements to see how contaminated we got. All of that was part of it. But ultimately, you're gonna have contamination and ultimately you're gonna to have to correct for it. So you just accept that and do this system of witness plates. That's what people are hoping will really um, make this much more accurate than it would otherwise have been. Excellent. Well, we do have one question. I'll wrap it up tonight for you. Um, did you at any time feel like you had to be a salesman, you know, with the changes in politics? All the time. People, yeah, I yeah. mean, you're putting a tie on and arguing to, to make sure you, you get there. reviewed like crazy by NASA, especially on a mission like this. This wasn't a flagship mission. It was one down from the flagship missions, New Frontiers class. But we were at the time kind of and still to this day, kind of a poster child for NASA because we had such a um, ambitious mission, but they rated us low risk, which is really kind of remarkable given what we wanted to do on this mission. And we got low risk rating, which is practically essential if you want to get selected. So we were scrutinized at every turn by NASA. So you were always in, in front of some review board or another. You were always asked to justify why are you doing things the way you're doing? 
why don't you do it this way? Why don't you do it this other way? Uh, what makes you think you're going to succeed? All of those things. And you're doing it all the time. Now, this is happening at the same time as you're building all your stuff and bad things are happening <laughs> while you're building all your stuff. In fact, we have names for them, right? So every time something bad happens, you have to issue a report. It's called a problem failure report, PFR. We, we generated something like 130 PFRs during the course of the build of our own instrument. And I don't even know what of the spacecraft. That was too much to track everyone else's PFRs. I was enough just to track my own. So the PFRs would typically walk in the door on a Friday afternoon, just, just before you were gonna go away for the weekend. You know, so you'd be working all weekend to try to figure out what you were gonna do. You know, you'd be facing some kind of review panel on Monday, you know, so, and you'd have to have a plan. Right. So it's just like, OK, do the best you can get it done. You know, no, I agreed 100 percent. And uh, uh, being an engineer working in construction, yeah, everything happens at five o'clock or uh, at one in the morning when things aren't available. Yeah, when you're not at your best, too. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, well, uh, Dr. Bashar, I think we will end today here at this point. And uh, we have you scheduled to pick up tomorrow at 1 p.m. Central Time with the group. And I appreciate everyone submitting their, their questions and such. And hopefully they've been challenging to you. We've been trying to throw everything we can at you to trip you up. Yeah, and, stop uh, me. You said harder the better. So let's... Uh, yeah, the harder the better. <laughs> we'll do. So other, right, than care, that, other than that, sir, uh, we will see you tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Thank you for your time. And most of all, have yourself a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.